Hi everyone. Thanks for coming out on your lunch break. Some of you were here when we had our first design guidelines public input session in March. This is the follow-up session for that. And since then, um, we've been busy working behind the scenes with the team at Perspectus out of Cleveland, who is our consultants working on this project with us to kind of take into consideration all of the input and concerns and suggestions that were voiced at the March meeting. We had to delay this meeting a little bit for a number of reasons, but here we are. So thank you for your attendance and participation. I just want to say that from the Erie Downtown Partnership standpoint, and I'm Emily Fetchko, acting CEO of the Erie Downtown Partnership. Our role in this is really to help leverage and incentivize good design of the built environment, something we care very much about. It aligns with our mission of creating a safe, welcoming, and fun downtown. Emphasis for this on safety and welcoming. We want to create those welcoming spaces, and that includes the commercial core. So for us, we've had a long-standing facade improvement grant, and we've leveraged over a million and a half dollars in facade grant improvements. There's a robust need for people to work on their facades, including signage and painting and masonry and windows and doors. And it's a wonderful incentive for people that are, you know, property owners that are trying to attract tenants to their buildings. This is a really nice way for them to access some grant money, um, which often can be leveraged with the city's facade grant money, which is really nice, sometimes even through Preservation Erie. There's a lot of options right now. Things have slowed down a little bit because of the pandemic. Costs of materials are really going up in price, but we hope by giving people a playbook to reference as far as what to consider and when, um, really making those suggestions on materials and suggested colors, but more importantly, what I'm really excited about and what Perspectives is gonna share with you is you know, using this as a true handbook and tool to access resources and information about how to go about considering a facade improvement or maintaining your facade or doing a repair. There's a lot of information out there. So being able to curate this in one snazzy little handbook is really important. We'll make it available on our website we're going to have educational materials, which will be the next steps after we finalize these design guidelines. Very much a working draft right now. Um, and then we're going to have educational workshops. So we're going to further advance the conversation and really help people understand how they can leverage and use the guidebook, what tools and resources are available, and bring some other key partners to talk about how they can incentivize and help you finance your facade improvement projects. So with that, I do want to thank our advisory committee. We have one member here, Melinda Myers. She's been instrumental in this project from the beginning, so thank you, Melinda, so much. Um, our team at the Erie Downtown Partnership, Dave Tamulonis, who helps market and promote everything that we're doing, including advancing our facade projects, and the team at Perspectus, who's really been amazing to work with, and I think they've come up with something really intentional, really specific, and user-friendly that hopefully will help advance the built environment in downtown and underscore that welcoming aspect that we care about at the Erie Downtown Partnership. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Elizabeth and Polly of Perspectus. Good afternoon. My name's Polly Lynam Bloom. I'm a historic preservationist with Perspectus. And I have with me Elizabeth Corbin Murphy. She is one of our principal architects and specifically is a fellow of the American Institute of Architects and a historic architect. So today what we're going to do is uh, give you a brief overview of the content. We're not going to go page by page, but we're just going to try to give you an overview of the scope of the design guidelines and allow a little bit of time at the end for comments and questions. And we're being brief because we know you're on your lunch hour. So before we start, I do want to thank uh, Emily and Melinda and the um, Erie Downtown Partnership for their guidance in really identifying what specifically Erie needed. Um, because when we create these guidelines, we want to make them for your community, not for anybody else's. It's for the type of buildings that you have. So. So there's a lot of people involved, but most importantly, I know that you have a Keystone Historic Preservation Grant helping to pay for these guidelines. And I know that you recognize that this grant was well intended and you appreciate it. Um, today, as I said, we're gonna just talk a little bit about 
what the scope was, the content, also talk about the feedback that we had at the end of the meeting in March with our other associate, Lauren Burge, and then we'll have some time for closing comments. So the scope was to create design guidelines that covered the study area from 14th Street to 2nd. And this area of um, State Street is one of the most historic, especially because the community evolved from the Bay and State Street was where it all started. Today, we're at the stage where we're starting to end the creation stage. We've done research, writing, and editing, and we're moving into the confirmation and completion stages. And then, as we spoke, in the fall, hopefully beginning in September, we'll start to do some presentations to key partners and elected officials and begin education and training workshops. And we anticipate that um, some of those can be online so we can resort, use the resources of streaming for that and get more participants. Next, we're gonna just really briefly cover the content. So the chapters here really are outlined to, as Emily said, to provide resources for the citizens, the building owners, and the property owners to make good decisions about how, how they can maintain and improve their historic buildings. This is all to support a vibrant downtown Erie, especially as new development comes. And Elizabeth and I saw that proof today with the amount of construction that we had to bypass, but we like to see that, so it's exciting. And these guidelines will really encourage quality investment and improvements so that the look and feel of this historic area can remain an asset. So the first chapter is just really a brief introduction. Um, what we're looking for here is to explain the purpose of the guidelines as we've discussed today. Although they are not specifically tied to the ordinance that was passed, 1221, which did establish the Historic Review Commission and gave this community the ability to identify um, historic landmarks and recommend historic overlay zoning districts. These um, guidelines will help review proposed building changes and help people understand what they have to do if they do want to identify an area for a landmark or a historic building, and also if they need to get a certificate of appropriateness. Um, but primarily what these are for is to present best practice using national standards, the Secretary of the Interior standards for the treatment of historic properties, and it's a resource that's written in non-legal language. The study area, as we spoke about, covers both sides, the east and west side of State Street. And this area includes buildings that date from the 1830s to the 1990s and a wide range of architectural styles. In fact, we need to comment to you what a wide range of architectural styles you have. Um, it goes beyond many communities that we've worked with. I don't think we've had brutalist. Right. Right. <laughs> so you took us from here all the way up to Brutalist. Yes, yeah, we do have a question, because if it's to go to State Street, what's the status of the hospital? Because it does have, part of the hospital would be a historic property. We don't have too much <laughs> so, so we're pushing the boundaries just a little bit. We think you ought to go just another block Pass so you can include the historic part of the hospital. So you can keep that under consideration. Yes. For right now, the district stops at 2nd Street. And um, on this map, you'll see the red stars, and these are buildings that are on the National Register of Historic Places. And then as we spoke, the Bayfront Parkway and the Bay uh, was where early development started. And so those first few blocks between 3rd and 5th are where there still are some historic fabric of buildings from the early 19th century. Most specifically, the beautiful old Customs House, which dates from 1839, and the Cashier's House next door. That's in the 400th block. 
and it is where there are it's some nice intact 19th century buildings. And then as Erie grew, we saw that it began to fill in between the 500 and 800 block and even over to 10th, 11th as they even still developed economically. This next um, chapter is about Erie history. Um, I really have to say um, it was eye-opening as I looked at the history of Erie and I'm not going to try to go into it really long. I'll try to try to start at 1300 BC and take us up to <laughs> but um, in Erie I think um, one thing that's important is the fact that this area actually dates back to 1300 BC. The Paleo Indian people settled in the Ohio Valley in western Pennsylvania after crossing to Alaska probably on a land or ice bridge for northeastern Asia. So I don't think we ever really think about those things but um, you know we had early uh, peoples in this area and unfortunately by early 1000 BC most of the um, people had disappeared from the region. But one thing we found exciting was the 19, seven, this 1975, 1795 Ellicott Plan, which is a beautiful, elegant plan with the wide streets and avenues and the east-west streets running parallel to Presque Isle Bay. And the beauty of it is just the three divisions, how it allowed for growth. It thought about how these central parks would make these beautiful divisions within the community. And each one would allow a little more growth and a little bit more structure. Um, when people started settling in Erie, these were early settlers of English descent, followed by Portuguese, German, Irish, Russian, Swedish, Finnish, Polish, Italian, and African Americans. As many of you know, Erie was a port city with shipbuilding and transportation driving its growth, and it did play a key role in the Battle of Erie of 1813 and participated in the Canal Erie with the Erie Canal and its extensions. Rail was also very important to bring coal, iron ore, or oil extraction and refining, and this port was a busy spot. In fact, we found that in 1890, the city directory had 40 hotels right in this State Street area. We also, in this area, cover the population, government, and culture, and discuss the legacy of important architecture with, which Elizabeth is going to cover. Um, we are excited. Erie has both high style and vernacular architecture, and it really represents the development of the community as you proceed up State Street. So with that, I'm going to pass it to Elizabeth. So Polly's left me to talk about style and architecture. And we have listed here the ways that we classified the architecture that we saw. And I will tell you that your interpretation of a style can be just as leg legitimate as my interpretation. So if you want to say, oh, well, we put Italianate details on this building and somebody else says no no they're Queen Anne you might be separating by two or three years and you know we don't have to worry about it so much the idea is that we look at the total building and the feeling that you get from the total building and then how can we maintain that feeling that history of the appearances as well as the form and the function so those are, those are the, well, I'm not going to show you every one of them. We picked out a couple because we wanted to show you how the, how the guidelines were organized. So each style is discussed and the points of interest in each style are labeled hopefully in clear, concise points so that they can be followed. And they give you an idea of how we have identified the styles. There are several resources that talk about the styles of mater and materials in, in the buildings that you have here. And at the end of the book, we have a lot of resources 
listed. So if you want more information on any one of the styles, it will be available to you. So we're showing an Italianate building. Those are a lot of Main Streets have Italianate buildings. They were built zero lot line, they're two, three, sometimes four stories, and they have, uh, they're structured with a street level facade that is commercial, and then they would have either office space or residential on the upper levels. And a lot of your buildings are structured that way where they have storefronts on the first floor and office or residential on the upper levels and their differences may be as minor as the as the detail in the masonry so the the one on the left is italianate and you can see the repetition of the windows and the types of hood molds that's the piece that's over the window the Romanesque Revival, which is on the right side. So th these are in the book in chronological order. They're not, they're not alphabetical, they're not by preference, no, no one style gets a preference over the other, but they're in chronological order so that you can help to see, it, it can help you see the growth of the city by how the buildings, how and when the buildings were constructed. So Romanesque Revival is heavier with the masonry. They have semicircular arches. You wouldn't have an odd-shaped arch in a Romanesque. Romanesque churches, in, for instance, in the Northern Europe would be the ones that are very heavy, have only a few openings. Openings are all semicircular, and they have very large masonry elements. So the revivals are, they give you a feel of that, but they're not nearly so heavy. They're made to fit the streets. So this one we're showing you as a 20th, early 20th century vernacular. So vernacular is a word that architects love to use. It rolls nicely off your tongue, but there's no way you're going to know what it means unless somebody tells you or you look it up because it, it's just one of those words. But vernacular has to do with how the architecture stylistically grew from the area. So the vernacular in the south is different than the vernacular in the north and different from the east coast to the west coast. So if you say to, to yourself when you're driving by, oh, that has a Southwest flavor, that's a vernacular that might have grown from Arizona or Southern California. So if you look at buildings at Miami Beach and they're pastel and they're kind of square and they have flat roofs and they have you know, maybe Art Deco signage, that would be a vernacular for Southern Florida. So in the Great Lakes region, the vernacular was, it, it developed from the need to keep out the cold. You know, I, my brother lives in Claremont, California, and his kids went to a school where they ate lunch outside. Can you imagine doing that here? So you can see that sometimes the function had, had an influence and the climate had an influence on a building. And this one is a fairly simple zero lot line structure with brick that's probably local or maybe from Ohio. And so it's developed in, and, and it's in the time period where there was a lot of architectural experimentation. So it's got a mix of the influences from the Great Lakes region and response to architecture at the time and response to the climate. And 
yet when you drive by a building like this, you're going to always know that, that that's a building from the early 20th century, and it's a business building, zero lot line. Um, zero lot line means it's built right to the edge of the lot on the street. Okay, so in these, again, there's little points of how to recognize the buildings and a little description of how they fit into the city of Erie. And there's one of those for all of the styles that we identified. And you can, another thing that's, that's kind of quirky about defining styles is that there's vernacular on this side and on the other side is high style or very uniquely stylistic and fits all of the boxes in, in your architectural history class. Okay, so, so most things are built in between. So you see, you see the two revival styles that we saw before this, they, they might have, the, even though we're, we're trying to build a Gothic revival, it might have some influences from the styles on either side of it chronologically. So the idea of finding the perfect style is, is um, unrealistic. So even when you're writing National Register nominations and they ask you what style it is, we sometimes discuss it with the State Historic Preservation Office because we have one idea and they have another idea and we might both be right. So it's okay for you to have an opinion about your building and it's okay for you to love it for certain reasons or not love it for certain reasons, but each one of those characteristics that are stylistic go to the flavor of the downtown and the flavor of the main street. So we like for you to appreciate those quirks when you rehab a building or when you preserve it. Those are the things that give it its character. Okay, so we have crafted these guidelines with a philosophy in mind. And, and I started to introduce that to you by talking about the character of your building. When you look at the standards for rehabilitation, which are the national standards, um, and I think I'm going to stop here and step sideways a little bit. The Secretary of the Interior Standards for Rehabilitation are the guidelines that are published by the National Park Service. And even though we reference them often here, because the, in my mind they're very good common sense guidelines, you're not required to meet the national guidelines unless you're using federal money. Okay, so if you're going after historic tax credits or if you're using a Save America's Treasures grant or a Department of T Transportation grant, then you must follow the federal guidelines. If you're not doing that and you're not using federal money, then the requirements are local. And so we're giving you this guidebook so it helps you keep tidy with what's going on in Erie without, without the worry of a cloud over you that says this is the national standard. So I, I need for everyone to understand that because this is meant to be a user's guide and a piece that makes owning a historic structure fun, basically. Certainly when you're waiting for the building materials to show up or, or the contractor's late or something, it's not always fun, but working with an historic building uh, can be fun and I'd, and we would really like for you to think of it that way. Okay, so I'm going to talk just a little bit about architecture and preservation and design philosophy. And Polly and I were talking about it on the way up. Maybe we're going to make those drawings bigger. So when you're looking at a building and trying to decide whether you're building a new one or rehabbing your building, you want to look at the context. So the context about which we speak today is 
the main street and you have neighbors and that you all share a zero lot line and you have sidewalks and people walk by so that's your context so for you to put an infill building in between the historic structures it doesn't have to match the historic structures but it needs to respect their form so it would be out of context to build an infill building, you know, in, in an empty lot between two historic structures. It would be out of context to take that building and push it back 100 feet and then park on that side of the lot. That would be out of context for your downtown Main Street. Uh, some of the other things we think about is that most of these buildings are two, three, four stories. So if you were taking an infill building between two three-story buildings, to build that 12 stories high is kind of also out of context. So does it mean you can't do it? That you get to talk to the city of Erie about. But those are the things that you want to think about when you're considering how to address your structure. So after we get over the big things, the context and the height and the si sitting on the lot, then some of the other things come into play, like the materials. If the, if the building is brick, we generally like to keep it brick. So the guidelines will have resources on how you can repair brick or um, if there's some pieces missing, how you might replace them. And you want to look at the storefront. And if the storefront is all open, it's good to keep it all open rather than close it up. So some of those are some of the things you want to look at. Also, you want to look at the, the, the materials. You, you don't generally put vinyl over brick or historic stone. I, I mean, I know that's an extreme example. But we try to see if we can't work with the materials that are there. Now, does that mean you can't ever use replacement materials? No, it doesn't. But it's important to look at the characteristic of the materials and how it fits in with the building and how you can more easily repair them without frankly, without running up your costs. If you can manage what's there, it keeps your costs down. So that's a really good thing to think about. Uh, when you're looking at following the philosophy of design guidelines, generally we talk about keeping the historic characteristics, which is what we just talked about in the styles. So if you have brackets on the building, it's nice to keep them. If if you have hood molds on the building, it's nice to keep them. If you have double hung windows, it's nice to keep them or replace them with like windows, like replace them with double hungs. Some of those kinds of things. And these are all philosophical approaches to the design of the building. And that hopefully is all for the betterment of your structure not meant to be a restriction. So I'm only giving a few examples here and that, and that gives you an idea of how you might approach the design of your building. Let's see here. Okay, so which one is that? I think that I've talked about this a little bit, so we're just going to go. General recommendations. So I think that all of you would be very disappointed if the Warner Theater took down that marquee, right? And um, I also imagine that there's been a time period in its life where that's been discussed because it becomes difficult sometimes to maintain these things. So that is a perfect example of a building characteristic that would completely change that building if that were to come down. So uh, those are things to talk about. Ah, doors and entries. So 
as we talk about doors and entries just a bit, I think that there's a lot of things to talk about here. In, in the Great Lakes region, it's cold. And often we like to talk about having, you know, a little bit of an airlock on your way in. So there are ways to add an airlock to a building without bringing that door all the way out to the street. So you still have the door that comes at an angle and it's that still, you still have your entry sequence and you still have your uh, characteristics of your streetscape. Along with that, along with that we have accessibility issues. So this door in particular has a four inch step. And those of us who are able-bodied take those steps for granted. People in chairs with wheels have trouble. And frankly, it's good for your business if you can get that person in the chair in because why lose a customer for any reason? So uh, there are lots of ways to solve accessibility issues in historic structures that are imaginative, creative, not too expensive, and so I want to encourage you to look at them when you make changes. I think this is a good time for me, well, maybe not. I'm gonna say it now anyway. The Americans with Disabilities Act is civil rights legislation, and it, when it was first passed, it really had nothing to do with the building code. It was passed in the early 90s after a lot, a lot, a lot of advocacy, even by architects in wheelchairs. So when the Americans with Disabilities Act was passed, it had a section for historic structures. And it talked about the exemptions that you can take for historic structures. And if the building is a certified historic structure, you can say no. You can say no, I don't want to meet the, the Disabilities Act, Americans for Disabilities Act. However, that goes against getting customers into your building and it makes a big noise. And if you say no, somebody can still sue you. So we don't like to go there. So it's much easier to see if there isn't a way to get everybody into the building. So over those 30 years from the early 90s, building codes started to adopt sections of the ADA within the building code. So you don't have to think so much about the civil rights legislation, you have to look at the building code. And that gives you the guidance for how to meet the letters of the law but you have an historic structure and you can't meet the letter of all of the things in the building code. So Ohio has chapter 34, Pennsylvania has chapter 12, and those are the chapters of the building code that specifically address historic structures and give you alternative ways to meet the building code. So if anybody tells you, oh, it'll cost you so much to come up to the building code or you'll never meet the building code, those things just aren't true anymore because the building codes really, really look hard at historic structures and at making reasonable accommodation to fit the code into the buildings. So the point of the code is to help the health, safety, and welfare of its occupants. So for instance, if you have sprinklers in a building, the purpose of the sprinklers is not to save the building, it's to keep the fire down until all the people are out. So if you can keep that in mind, that the building code is there to protect people, then it makes it easier to follow. But using chapter 12, in, I think Pennsylvania's code is actually really good in this manner. The Pennsylvania building code requires that you if you're making major changes, that you have your architect or engineer write 
a description and evaluation of the building so that when they go to look at your drawings, the building code official has already read all about your building and understands that it's a two-story uh, brick building with wood joists and plaster on the walls so that when he reviews your plans, he knows the conditions that you already have. So it used to be that when you turned in your building code, your building drawings to the code officials, that they would just go through and say, you're not meeting this, you're not meeting this, you're not meeting this, you're not meeting this. And then you'd have to go back and forth um, adjudicating the changes to each one of those. But Pennsylvania lets you start with an old building and an understanding of what the building looks like so that code does not become a stumbling block. Instead, your code official says, oh, do it this way or, oh, do it this way, because they're already on the same page with you. So I just thought that was a really brilliant thing to do, because the code official is supposed to be helping you. They are civil servants, and we don't want to think of them as enemies. So we're really on the same page. Anyway, I, just, I thought that was brilliant, and I wanted to tell you about that. Ah. So these are just some samples of the wonderful ornamentation we found here. So sometimes when we write guidelines for cities and towns, um, the city or town has, is already missing so much fabric that we have to really dig to find wonderful photos like these. But here we had to dig to get rid of enough photos so that we could actually print this thing because we just had so much. It was really, it was really been a fun project for us. Okay, so I think I didn't follow your order, Polly. <laughs> so the building that we're in is considered brutalist. And that's, you know, always, I always think of Popeye and Brutus, you know, so the big guy that's always a bully. And while that is where that name came from, the brutalist period of architecture is the discovery of concrete as a building material. Now, mind you, concrete's been used since Roman times, so it's not a new material. But there's been a lot of discovery in engineering concrete, and so there was a lot of experimentation in the late 20th century on buildings that are constructed with concrete. So they fit into the brutalist period. And you have several reasonable examples of brutalism right on Main Street here. A lot of times, brutalist buildings are set apart, set in the middle of a, of a block instead of at the street. But you have several that are actually in the Main Street District, and that's unique. So that needs to be celebrated, too. Yeah. OK. Yeah, I talked about that, too. I really went out of order, didn't I? OK, so here's a couple examples of, of uh, things that are in the Americans with Disabilities Act. So when they passed the law for ADA, they quickly generated a guidebook on how to follow the law. And so you will see diagrams like this about how a wheelchair fits on a ramp and how you can turn a corner in a wheelchair. Wheelchairs are not the only, people that cannot walk are not the only disabilities that are protected by ADA. So we have a lot of other things like can you hear or can you not see or, you know, sometimes you're disabled, you know, I broke my heel and got to practice this, you know, because I couldn't put any weight on it and I was on crutches for way too long. And, but I got a lot of experience in, in what people who are 
disabled deal with every single day. And so the Dis Americans with Disabilities Act is meant to protect everybody. And so these diagrams are available as a resource. How do you, how do you put in a door that can be opened by a person in a wheelchair without assistance? And how do you put in a ramp that works? So there are some successful ramps out here on Main Street. Some of them, I am guessing, were compromises with the building code officials. And some of them are really well done. There's one that's uh, changed the slope of the sidewalk really gradually in front of the building so that you could get into the building. But that, that other door that I showed you that had a four inch rise, there was probably enough room just to slope from the door to the front sidewalk. So all you would have to do is take out that one piece of concrete and slope it down so then you could get in the building. So that one was probably easy. Um, so there's a lot of solutions for those kinds of things. And hopefully our section on maintenance and repairs gives you just an overview in your head of how you deal with these kinds of things because there's no way you can learn everything there is to know about masonry by reading the two pages in the guidebook. But at least it will give you an idea of maybe lingo, how to talk to somebody, um, things that you should be aware of. Um, Polly and I are in the historic studio in our firm of 50 people. And we have these people that do multi-million dollar buildings for the Cleveland Clinic come over and ask us how to deal with the historic masonry in the building next door because they don't have a clue. You know, they do the new stuff and we do the old stuff. So, so in this lower photo, you see that star? That star is likely not ornament, but the end of a steel rod that goes through the building holding the two sides together. That was a very common before people considered putting reinforcing into masonry. They just went all the way through the building and held it together. So I, uh, I'm pretty sure that's what's going on there. Now, right next to that is some brickwork that's been patched with incompatible mortar. So those are things that are so easy. You just buy the right kind of mortar the first time around, then you're fine. It doesn't cost any more. Oh, demolition. Do we have to talk about demolition? So there's preservation by neglect, you know, where you happily find a vacant building that's still in good shape that to fix up. And then there's demolition by neglect where somebody lets his building run down thinking you'll let them tear it down because it's already run down. And those are things that the city gets to deal with within their own uh, planning and zoning regulations. But hopefully these guidelines will help you so that we don't run into those problems as often. Often cities have an ordinance for demolition that will require a report be written before the demolition it takes place, especially if it's in a historic district or if it's listed in the National Register. And the report has to state that they've tried really hard and they can't find anybody to take the building from them. And then sometimes they have to have a period like 90 days or something where the building owner must advertise this building is being demolished unless you want to buy it. So that, those are things that go on with the planning department and every city is different in how they handle those, but there are ways to keep these buildings from disappearing and there are times when the buildings really must go. And I've had people tell me I should never say that out loud, but that's, it's the truth. Not every building can be saved, so we, did we really have to say that today? I suppose so, yes. 
Okay, so we have appendices which have, um, we have a glossary, it's, it's good, it tells you all the lingo. And we have the Secretary of the Interior standards that I told you about. So why is the Secretary of the Interior? So the way things work is that there's the city level and then the state level is run by the State Historic Preservation Office. And for you, that's under the Pennsylvania Museum Group. And uh, then above them is the National Park Service who issues these guidelines and the National Park Service is under the Secretary of the Interior. So all of these standards and they have them for everything. They have them for rehabilitation. They have them for planning. They have them for, for architects' experience. But the Secretary of the Interior's standards are all under the, the same. The Secretary of the Interior takes care of the built environment as well as the natural environment. So I don't know. Do we have? Oh, there's the glossary with more cool pictures. Uh, oh, this is a good thing. This is an inspection checklist. This is fun. This, this, is, this simplifies all the stuff we just talked about onto one sheet. You can walk around and look at it on the building and check it off. Did, did I check this and, or do I need to find more information about how to fix this? Or um, So the inspection checklist is really good. You can print that out if you like. Um, oh, yes, this is fun. So last time when Lauren was here, she asked a few questions in order to figure out what the priority of the people in the room was. So the, what they thought was the most important reason to do design guidelines. And you can see the top one was encouraging the quality of investment and improvement in historic buildings for a vibrant downtown. Now, I'm gonna guess if you read most of those other ones, they all go to vibrant downtown. And so that's the purpose of doing the guidelines and that's what the guidelines is supposed to help, to maintain uh, a vibrant downtown. Uh, and which is the most pressing design challenge? Ah, general maintenance, new construction in historic districts, and application of the ADA. Those are the top three, and that is overwhelming. We, I think we've addressed most of those today. Okay, so last time, Lauren asked everybody in the audience where they like to spend their money. And people shouted out cities where they like to go. And she didn't tell them why she asked that question. But we'll tell you now. We wanted to see if the places you like to go have design guidelines. And the ones that are in bold have design guidelines. So it makes you think that, I hope it makes you think that design guides are good for a vibrant downtown and for places where people spend their money. And I want to tell you something that's really interesting. Lauren and I have been asking this question at these kinds of meetings for over 20 years. And no matter what combination of cities that we got, whether it was Paris or Rome or Mexico City or, or Streetsboro, Ohio. We always get right around 82 to 85 percent of the build, of the cities have design guidelines. And it's just been really interesting. But if 82 to 85 percent of the, of the people who are getting your money are using design guidelines that kind of tells you that maybe you want to use them too so that they're getting money spent in your place too. And Erie really has a lot. You know, when we come in from Cleveland, 
we get off a 90 and come in along the water. And it's just so much fun. It's just really nice to see Erie from that direction and to come downtown. So I hope that we've given you some things to think about. And if you have any questions, we're very happy to answer them. How are we doing? Oh, I talked a lot, sorry. <laughs> it would have been okay for you to get the crook and pull. <laughs> uh, yes. Mm -hmm. So I am very glad that you brought that up because um, we're, we are actually speaking at the Association for Preservation Technology uh, conference in November, and it's in Detroit. And what are we speaking about? We're, we're talking about a building that we rehabbed in Cleveland that's right in the middle of everybody else's market rate housing that we put workforce housing in because it's right next to Cleveland State, and all the people that work at Cleveland State don't have anywhere to live. And, and this building, you know, the building is not great shakes. It was a, it was a Stuyvesant Motor Car sales and repair building. You know, it's uh, five stories tall, had a really cool uh, car elevator in it. But it had these huge industrial windows, and we put new windows in that were insulated glass and you can see the entire of Cleveland from this building but you have to be income eligible to get in there and so we want to talk about more of that now I am not familiar yet with how they distribute the HUD funding in Pennsylvania but I do know how they do it in Ohio, and it's competitive. So you have to have your project, uh, it, it has to be, the project has to be within a half a mile of a library, within walking distance of a grocery store, within walking distance of medical uh, facilities, and within walking distance of mass transit. So all of those things are requirements in order to get the HUD money for for the workforce housing and um, I think I think it's great and I think more people need to pay attention to those building types within the urban centers because it would be really easy to have all um, upper level luxury and high market rate housing and have nobody work in downtown so it's, it's, you ask that question a lot. Please ask everybody that question. And, and I think it's really important to let your elected officials know your concerns because we just recently in Ohio had the State Historic Preservation Office get lobby with the state to increase the historic tax credits. But you can get 10% more if you offer low income housing as part of your tax credit project. So it's giving those ideas to the elected officials, some of the people who can lobby for you from historic preservation, because it's working. We see it. I mean, you know, Elizabeth specifically was talking about our project in um, Cleveland, but this week we were also in Akron, and we were at Goodrich, um, where an industrial complex has these beautiful beautiful apartments. In fact, we had a young architect with us who was asking, how much are they? Because I want to get in there. And, you know, already they have a waiting list the minute that they open up, but 20% of those residents are going to be meeting income standards. And frankly, I think all of us are seeing the benefits of having diversity in our environments. 
that you embrace it, you're getting different cultures. And that's what was going on in the buildings that we're seeing this come to. It's not a negative. In fact, I think people see it as a positive. So when you're walking down to the elevator lobby or they're having the common areas, you're getting cultures intermingling. And I think today's society is really looking for that. So it's only an advantage. And it's people on the ground like you in your community who just needs to keep on asking for it and encouraging the state officials. Yeah, so I don't know if Polly said it, but the, we're right now we're redoing buildings number 10 and 17 at the BF Goodrich facility, and they have 20% uh, income eligible in that building. And they have like, I don't know, 400 units. So 20% of that's a lot. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. So the twenty percent that's in Akron. Okay. That that project's in Akron. Cleveland is doing it. Cleveland Cleveland when it has certain funding. Yes. Like yes. If you if you go after certain funding, then you must include you must include uh, income eligible. Tower City. City, Terminal Tower. Yeah, Terminal Tower. Yeah, the Tower City is old now. Um, Terminal Tower has that requirement. It's part of the capital requirements, and that, which are multiple layers. You know, they probably have HUD. They probably have yeah. some tax strikes from the community, and so they build that in. But once right. again, it's you know just reinforce with your community how important it is because so, it does work. It's you're, we're starting to see right. the benefit. So, sometimes it, it makes the financing layers look really complicated. However, if you can, the, the, other, the other situation, what the city of Cleveland has, is they have TIF financing that you can't have unless the building meets the energy code. So that's good. Yes. Oh. Is I don't I don't know the answer to that. Is that you? Has there been any intersection? So yes, there's been intersection. Whether there's intersection in downtown Erie, I'm not sure. But the I will tell you right off the bat that our nation's landfills are filled with 65% building materials. So if you don't tear down a building, you are being green. That's to start. And then. Uh, it is difficult to make your building green because a lot of the green building products came from product manufacturers who weren't necessarily looking at anything but new construction. So now there's starting to be evolution. And one of the things I was telling Polly that I saw at the AIA conference two weeks ago is that there are um, a couple of the roofing shingle companies now have uh, solar panels incorporated into the shingles. So you can put new three-in-one shingles on your historic home and nobody knows it unless they're really, really looking and they can see a couple of strips that, that uh, transfer the... Um, the water. It, I mean, I, I was flabbergasted. I knew that Tesla had been doing it with the terracotta tiles, uh, but t most people can't afford terracotta tiles unless they're, uh, unless it's an 
individual building that has a foundation or something like that. But the, when I saw that they had it in the three-in-one shingles, I was very happy. And I think, you know, we're starting to see standards and, you know, when we see RFPs for, um, you know, issues regarding stormwater. I know, like, um, the courthouse in, in Cleveland, we had yeah. to deal with, you know, stormwater issues and kind of bringing some new technologies uh, there. You know, you've had many um, flooring products that are, are, have a large component of a recycled. So, you know, like Elizabeth said, you're being green by recycling your historic building. So right. that is getting you 60% there. So I know in our office, we write our specifications um, specifically for recycling. So if you take materials out, the contractor has to meet certain limits of, of recycling so they're not going to the landfill. And uh, they also, every, every building product, every element that is taken out of a building, the owner has the right of first refusal. So if they're, let's say they have a whole bunch of, of uh, lighting that you don't want to put back in, but it's saleable or reusable in another building, then it doesn't get wasted. And, some, and, and they can al always go to uh, Habitat for Humanity so that they're actually reused. And those are the things that are achievable on a small building, small property owner uh, level. I mean, if you're looking at uh, GSA building, you know, a government services agency building, then they look also at how much insulation they can add to the inside of a giant uh, courthouse. But those are not usually affordable for, uh, you know, these kinds of Main Street buildings. Some things that are affordable are um, upgrading your heating system, um, up, and, and sometimes you only have to up, upgrade the controls of the, of the heating and cooling systems. And if you do replace the windows, replace them with ones that have a long life and ones that have good um, or low transmission of heat and good uh, insulation properties. And, and the, you know, the secretaries of the interior standards, when you start to look at the recommendations for almost any product used in the building, they're having you start at what's the bare minimum you can do to bring that product back. Um, a really good example we get into is windows. Um, you know, the first choice is can you maintain that wood window? Um, if it needs a better level of um, protection, can you put a storm, you know, on top of it and still retain the character without you know, uh, hurting what is already there and was original to the building. So a lot of the Secretary of the Interior Standards are very green in, in just the approach right. that they take. So if you want to keep your old windows, there's this stuff called vacuum glass. And it's only a quarter of an inch thick. So it looks like a single pane of glass, but because it's a vacuum, it works like insulated glass. So there's a lot of products out there that can be used by buildings of this level, you know, this size on Main Street that can be, increase your energy efficiency um, without running up the costs of the building. And again, if you were looking to get on a larger scale of building, then there's a lot more we can do. But um, I think that if that's not in there, it should be. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, the sustainability issue. There, it took the, even the American Institute of Architects a long time to join the Historic Resources Group with the Sustainability Group. Um, but there is a, there's a book written by a friend of mine, well, Donovan Ripkema, but, but there's a book about sustainability and preservation written by uh, Jean Caroon, architect out of Boston, that's really good. So I think raising the awareness is, is good, and so it's good to ask that question as many times as you can. Any other questions? 
Well, thank you for being patient and giving up your lunch hour to be with us today. And we'll look forward to seeing you in the workshops. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>